I'm loud enough. If not, you can like do this. Okay. This debate is going to be won by the team which proves that the woman in general and the feminist movement is going to be better under these narratives that are defending. We're going to defend two points. First, that the narrative in our side of the house is going to A, work better, and B, even if it does work at the equal stage, that is going to be better for women if applied at the same level. First, a little model, I think that is symmetric for both narratives, but we think that what we're going to do is just to educate women with a, with a narrative that um, uh, that, that uh, th what matters is not the bodies, uh, uh, while they have to educate in the other side, like in public speak uh, speeches, etc. The leaders of the feminist movement doing this. Okay, now we have two points. First point is that it's going to be easier to sell the narrative of that bodies does not matter. Two reasons here. The first reason is that the narrative that they want to sell, the narrative that bodies does not ma that does not matter, has to fight against a narrative that already exists in the society, which is the, the narrative that the, that the the that the marketing and the and the public culture defends, which is women just uh, are judged by by the by their bodies. Uh, uh, um, in fact, the, we, we like like blonde women, which are fit and which are la like in very good uh, uh, physical shape. That narrative already exists, and you have to fight against that. Second here is that this narrative has to be created from scratch. Never in history there has been like a philosophy or, or, or a culture uh, a narrative which is important which says that that the voice does not ex uh, matter at all. From Romans, from uh, to, to, to the. Uh, to the French Revolution, all we say that the body and the mind are connected and that both matter. In the other hand, when you sell the narrative that bodies does not matter, you have one. You have this support of the marketing and support of the pop culture because yes, it has some part of the, of the narrative of, of marketing that says that body matters, but it's another part of the marketing which is this typical narrative of no, the importance is inside you, the importance is how nice you are, the importance is that it's real love, it's not real love. So that narrative already exists. And it's not has to be created from a scratch. So you have two points of support that they will never have. First, you don't have to create it from a scratch. Secondly, you don't have to fight against a narrative which is in the marketing, which is in the pop culture, and which has a lot of strength and which be, to be very difficult to fight against. Second reason why we think it's going to be easier to sell is because the narrative that opposition has to sell is anti hierarchy anti uh, hierarchization. Why is that the case? Because they say that all, uh, all the boys are equal and therefore I try by the language to say that all of them are equal in, in the, uh, in, in, uh, all women are equal. But the point is that when women see this, they say, that's a lie. There are women that have much, much better life than me, people love them more than me, and therefore I see that the equality does not exist. What is your narrative trying to say? Your narrative is trying to say, hey, it's not equal, the quality has not to be the, the point. We have the, the, just we have to hierarchize and to classify according to different criteria. We say bodies is not a criteria, but it's not saying that you have to be equal. You have to be classified by how nice you are, how intelligent you are, how are your capacities. This is easier to sell because you see, but because we think that when you see the society, you are never going to see an equal society in our world. Therefore, the narrative that they want to sell is never going to be easy to sell because you are once and once again to see that it fails, that is not true, that women of my same so social scale are, have better life, that boys go, uh, love them more than me, and they have better jobs. We think that this is awful and they are not going to be able to prove it. No, thank you. The, the, the true impact of the argument is one, women are going to believe more in this narrative and therefore embrace more the feminist movement and love more themselves because they are going to e, a, 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 believe more in it and b see that this narrative works and that this narrative actually has a sense in this society of inequality and secondly it's going to be easier to persuade all the parts of the society to follow this movement and to follow the, 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 the ideas of the feminist movement as they don't do see that this narrative is completely breaking the, the, the the narrative that actually exists, but it's just like a continuation of a narrative that for decades has existed that the importance is inside you, and therefore it will be much easier to men and other parts of the society that are not feminist to believe in this. Before going to the second point, which is that uh, this will help more the women closer. I think that with time you can introduce this, but I think that society both, if we judge you because beauty, but also by capacities, therefore I think that at least one part of our narrative is already true, and therefore you will be able to see 
that, the, that this part of the narrative is uh, like it's happening. If you try to, to sell complete equality, I think that is going to be very difficult to them then believe. Even if we are not completely right, I think that intuitive trying to sell complete equality is going to be much difficult in once you are not saying this. Uh, uh, you are not seeing this in the society. Second point is why we think that we help more people in our side of the house, even if it works at the same level. So this point is completely independent. We think that the first narrative, the, the narrative that they have to defend, just tries to solve the problem of people being judged by physicality, because you say all bodies are equal, but they do not give an alternative of how have you, how how we have to judge women. We don't have a mind link or a mind connection of what does that mean that all uh, bodies are equal. Then how ha, how I have to judge women? And I think that this is able because you, in many parts of the society, will have answers to this question which we do not like. For example, maybe you judge women how 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 good wife she is. If she's good taking care of the house, if she's good cooking, if she's good taking care of children or how correct their behavior is. In the other hand, our case say that the narrative uh, that we're selling is not take attention to the bodies. This has a really strong link in the mind of everyone that what you have is to look inside the person. If you talk to anyone in the world and you say physicality is not important, the, ma the, 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 the sentence that's happening in their, in their brains is because what really matters is what is inside you, is your intelligence, or how good you are. Why is this the case? Because for years and decades, the culture uh, of Hollywood, the, the movies, the, the books, etc., say this, this sentence together, physicality is not important, what is important is inside you. So you put the focus not only in eliminating the problem of judging women by physicality, but you also put the focus on what's the, the, the alternative solution to judge them, which is judging because they are how they are good inside them. Therefore, we are not only solving the problem uh, right now, but giving the correct solution to this. We think that this is incredibly important because now we are promoting judging the, the women for how good persons they are, how intellectual or, or good capacities they have. And this is incredibly important because for decades, I mean for the entire history of humanity, women have never been judged for this, have never been judged for the capacity, for the intellectual capacity. And when they went to a job or they went to, to meet new people, they always were judged or what for, for their appearance or for how good behavior they have. We are breaking not only with the first problem, but with the second one. What's the case of open involvement? First, we, they have to prove that their narrative works in any sense. We think that this is going to be a failure, or at least a failure in the comparative with our narrative. And secondly, even if those, both narratives work at the same level, we think that, that our narrative solves both the problem and the possible second problem that comes if you misinterpret the, like, the other way of, uh, of judging the one. We are very proud to stand in, Bobo, in open involvement. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'm going to start off with firstly a bit of rebuttal and in the form of that rebuttal I'm going to explain to you our first constructive which is the idea of why this model works because OG's main problem was that on our side of the house we will not be able to somehow sell to all women this model that uh, that all bodies are beautiful but we'll only be able to do what, what they want to which is that beauty does not matter at all. We think that's fundamentally problematic firstly because I mean, like, let's look at it this way. If anything at all, the idea of equality itself has been present in society in very many forms. When it comes to other immutable characteristics that are also arbitrary, like intelligence, race, ethnicity, language, and, and, and uh, so nationality, and so on and so forth. However, the idea that they want to expound, which is that beauty does not matter, which also has been a part of collective consciousness for a very pe long period of time, is completely alien to social consciousness in the first place. The idea that equality between, beauty, uh, between deciding how beauty works for different body types is all that we want to make, which is a modification of an extant norm and not starting from scratch, which is actually the exact converse of what they say. Secondly, they tell us that with time we will be able to actually sell this particular principle. But the problem with that, Madam Speaker, is that they have to acknowledge that on their side of the house they have a really long-standing norm that beauty is important. 
that beauty exists. The power of a norm is that if more individuals buy into it, it becomes entrenched and far harder to opt out of. In the existence of such a well-entrenched norm, they are attempting to do something which is to go uh, completely against it, which is to say that that beauty does not have any value, it does not matter at all, that is far more difficult on their side of the house. And lastly, they believe that for some reason, selling the narrative that all body types are beautiful to women seems to somehow also devalue the other parts of the female agency, which is that intelligence is important, education is important, but that is not true at all. The two are not antithetical, they are in no way mutually exclusive. We tell you that you can also tell women that all body types are beautiful, make them happy for once, and then also tell them that education is important, intelligence is important, that they need to concurrently do both of this because they are being oppressed in a multi-causal manner on both fronts. Why does it work? Three reasons. Firstly, because it, it, it makes women uh, who look to the feminist movement for moral judgments, for, for support, far better. Secondly, this works particularly in developing countries where women have absolutely no support. Institutionally, the laws are not particularly in their favor. Organizationally, they're not hired. Bad hiring practices make it hard for them to actually engage in the workplace. And lastly, even socially, they face distrust from their families. We think that the feminist movement is their only alternative to get some form of support. And if they already believe that beauty is important in the feel bad because their body type doesn't fit into the category of beautiful and status quo, their model doesn't actually help them because it actually makes it seem like they're trivializing the issues of these women by telling them that, look, you're not actually, I mean, of course you feel bad that people are not calling you beautiful. Let me tell you that beauty doesn't matter at all, as opposed to saying you are beautiful. You should feel happy and comfortable with what you are. And if you want to change, you should have the freedom to want to change, to become more beautiful because achieving that standard also brings with it a happiness that they do not consider as a benefit. And thirdly, the, the, the idea, uh, the, on the question of modifying an extant norm, Madam Speaker, we are not going against something that has existed for thousands of years. We are merely trying to change the norm in men that there has to be an inherent equality in how they judge different types of women. We're breaking down an existing norm and changing it into something more palatable, which is far easier than what they propose, which is taking a radically new concept and shoving it down uh, the throat of a majority that already has a power imbalance by which they can hold power over you, therefore they fail. Mean Sub substantives. Firstly, we think that sexualization of bodies to, de to demean women is the fundamental tool that the patriarchy has used in order to control uh, a large swathe of power in society generally. Why is this the case? We tell you that social factors primarily determine beauty and these vary over a period of time. In the, in the 17th century, uh, being fat was beautiful because it was a sign of opulence. We believe that these can change over a period of time, which means that the very conceptions of the, the, the moral standards of beauty in the first place may have been arbitrary, but we tell you that men have cleverly used it to hegemonize that part, to make it seem like some body types are worse off than others, systematically to demean women, to keep them in their place and to own them and we think that's fundamentally problematic. Men have had the power to both decide and enforce their preferences. If you look at it, they can do it through invisible discrimination, they can use physical force in some places or socialization. Like for example, in Japan, small feet are preferable, they'll bind your feet and break it to bring it into the stereotype. Indians are not allowed to go outside because they tan them and, and dark skin is not preferable. So those are the ways in which men have used this thing. So the feminist movement's primary moral obligation then is to argue for the socially disadvantaged, for the women who have been on the receiving end of this oppression. So the question then uh, arises, how exactly does this work? Why does this slogan work? Firstly, it attacks the core philosophy that men have to discriminate on body type, which is scarcity. We believe that only few body types are naturally beautiful, which means that men who own them act in a similar manner of owning a rare diamond like the Kohinoor. It's being able to say that I have something that you all don't. That is what gives it value, the ability to be exclusionary in the first place. You take away their ability to be exclusionary, you take away their ability to strike women at the heart of it. And I give you all the benefits for why this will be destroyed by that slogan. But what about the idea of saying beauty does not matter at all? Why is that problematic? Firstly, because beauty is arbitrary, much like intelligence, much like everything else. But that does not mean that just because something is arbitrary, there isn't a significant amount of hard work that goes into shaping that in the first place. While people may think, and quite naively, that there is no, there's no hard work that goes into shaping beauty in the first place, that is a gross undercharacterization because there is a lot of hard work that can actually be implemented in order to make oneself beautiful. It is the achievement of a social norm. Not everyone might be intelligent, but through reading, not everyone might be great at debating, but through debating a lot, you can actually get to that standard that exists in society for good. That hard work is one thing that they do not consider on their side of the house. So even in our worst case, Madam Speaker, 
speaker, we tell you that we that in many cases, even without the hard work, we celebrate something that is arbitrary, like our nationality, our ethnicity, our idea of, of, of being a part of a particular religion that we do not have a choice to. We celebrate these arbitrary things, which means that their model does not account for any of these problems. So what harms can come actually from per perpetuating an idea that beauty does not matter? You primarily spit on the individuals who have worked really hard to get to a position that they consider beautiful by trivializing the work that they have done, by saying that their entire world view is incorrect. We think that there is an incorrect way to approach women who have already been marginalized, which is striking them when they're down. And, and why do we think we can spread this effectively? Because that's a fundamental question. Two reasons. First, because of the democratization of social discourse, we think women are far more included in mainstream discourse now, which means we will be able to get it across to men far more effectively that there, that there is an inherent equality between the way in which uh, body types are and that beauty cannot be pigeonholed into a few things. And more importantly, they have to take into account, and there's no analysis to prove this, that if they tell us that it is hard to perpetuate our norm in society because it, it goes up against a countervailing norm that some body types are beautiful, they should also go up against the same countervailing norm when they point out that beauty doesn't matter, which is that beauty is important. But here's the difference. In our case, we're only convincing men. In their case, they have to convince women as well that beauty doesn't matter. And for all those reasons, we think that we take this debate very proud to oppose. <laughs> I'll answer two very brief questions. First, in which world it's easier to sell the narrative of uh, this kind of narrative in our world, in the better world? And secondly, even if there's like 40 60 and everything wins, which narrative is itself better for women? Before that, it's one important thing to say on our world. Most of the things they say are basically non comparative for the world. Yes, there is sexualization. Yes, you can claim other things. You can claim intelligence. You can claim many things. But the thing this debate is about is when there's a needle exclusivity into what narrative to sell, is do you want to sell a narrative which claims that the women are, are all equal in beauty or that the beauty shouldn't be valued? Now we're going to prove which is better. Basically, first question, which alternative is better to be sold? They claim two things. First, that equality is a thing that is pretty existing in people, and hence it will be more able to be sold to people. I'm going to pump you an example. Even if equality is in your brains, which it is, you will probably don't think that Dan Laham is as good debater, as equal debater as I am. Because even if there's a concept in your mind, which is equality, that doesn't get transitivity to applicate equality to every situation you are presented with. Yes, equality exists, but that doesn't replicate to the fact that you can assume that everyone is equal in a given condition, even if it's by a heart. So the fact that something exists don't get predicated to every situation you see. Second thing they said is, that given there's a norm in society that says that beauty matters, it will be more difficult. Here, they are non-comparative. Yes, obviously, there's many years in life where they have been told that beauty matters. But let's see the comparative. It is much more to the alternative, which is for centuries, thousands of years, each society has chosen a type of beauty, X over Y. It has been changing, but in every society, you've chosen X over Y for thousands and thousands of years. So yes, there's norms, but as I'll prove after this, one of them are more easy to fight than the others. Having told you, I'm going to explain two of the things, comparative to this debate, why it is easier to sell this narrative. The first, because there's a pre-existing underlying society bias towards the particular narrative that we are trying to sell you, which is not in the other case. Why is this true? Because you haven't heard in the news, no one, or in ads, people saying, look, beauty is equal. You don't see that. But yet, you see films 
that empower women that are not like outstanding moms. You have <coughs> books which empower women that are like not the most beautiful woman in the class, but yet achieve that what she wants. Second reason in between here is because there is some kind of social blame for body discrimination. Yes, this doesn't happen everywhere, but yet people usually blame people that tell the others, look, I don't hire her because she's not pretty. There's a kind of social blame for situation in which people try to deviate from here. And people acknowledge that there's little influence that they can do or cannot do. Hence, even if it exists, there's a pre-existing underlying bias toward buying this narrative. What is the comparative? Second point Harry told you. That there's less mental barriers to tackle than in the other side. Hence, the mental barriers that exist to tackle the narrative they want to tackle are impossible to be defeated. Why is this the case? First, because there's thousands of years of marketing of people telling you that X was better than Y. This is pretty self-evident to see. But for years, you've seen the news, you've seen films where it was prioritizing one narrative or the other. But second line, and this is pretty important to debate. For 30, 50, 60 years, depending on how old you are, you've been taking decisions in which you think that X was better than Y. You probably married someone thinking that she was beautiful or that she was more beautiful than others. So this narrative that we sell is more easy to fit in the life narrative of people than the other because people constantly take decisions thinking that beauty exists. On the comparative, they can accept that beauty exists but say, okay, I took decisions given that beauty existed but they were wrong or, or not wrong because now I know that beauty is something that shouldn't be valued at all. On the comparative, you need to try to sell them that beauty didn't exist, that they take a decision based on something that didn't exist. On the comparative, I think it is much more easy for people to believe that now they have to change some of the ways they value things, but not that their life entirely chosen was given something that didn't exist. For all those reasons, we think it's much more easier to sell our narrative. Now, second point in this speech. Why do we believe that even if it's a was, which is not, we want this point, but why even if it's a was, if we achieve a 30, 40% of the impact they could achieve, it is better that we achieve that impact and it, why it's better in and of itself our narrative. What their narrative says is implicitly focus on body if you want, but acknowledge that everybody is good, but somehow it is underlying the fact that it's okay to focus in the body. But you just need to believe that everybody is good and everybody is okay. What is the problem with this? That it allows a narrative of, even if all of them are equal, I can prefer X over Y, even if they are equal. So people will be able to say, look, I, I know that both bodies are good, equal, but yet I prefer X over Y. As if you believe that I am as good as Dan and Hal, you could say, mm, okay, but it's still prefer Dan. Because even if they're equal, I prefer X over Y. What we do with our narrative is I change the focus. And I say, don't look at that. Don't look if he's fat or not. Don't look at the beauty. Look at all the things. I think that this entrenches discrimination because even if it does say to people, do believe that all of them are equal, it still permits choices given the beauty. I think that it stretches discrimination. What is the comparative? First, any point? Extension? No? Good. What is the comparative? The comparative here is that you promote a narrative in which you say, do not take into account whether it is X or Y, just take into account the other faction, the interior of themselves. What this empowers to society is to say, okay, bodies might be different, I know this, but it is bad, it is reprehensible, it is morally wrong probably to choose a person given that she is prettier or not. Hence, what we think, it disentrenches less discrimination, given that you don't uh, decide on these grounds. The impact of this is very simple. Even when they achieve what they want, and this is important, even if the proof is worse, we think that their narrative entrenches the social discrimination on basing your decisions on who you like, on what you like about those persons. Very proud to oppose that narrative, and very proud to propose less discrimination in society. For all of the very doubly proud to oppose. <laughs>
we're not going to be uncharitable and assume that convincing either side or men who've been benefiting from a system of patriarchy, who have entrenched values about how women should be, is going to be an easy task, which means admittedly convincing men especially or convincing the other side of either narrative's effectiveness is going to be incredibly hard, which means this has to be a comparative debate. And I think that opening government has not been comparative so far. So what are the options that are available then at the feminist movement's disposal? You can either choose to practice and inculcate a participatory norm that tries to take advantage of the fact that beauty is A, inevitable, and B, beauty is also in many circumstances value positive, or even if it's value neutral, it's okay because we celebrate a bunch of other arbitrary characteristics. So it just seems disingenuous to disregard beauty and say, ah, it's okay, we're going to absolutely completely just ignore it in the first case. But either way, whether it's value positive or whether it's arbitrary, the only option that we can automatically do is either borrow from the sort of already empowered norm of equality that we currently know and currently appreciate and try to build this narrative of a participatory structure that tries to empower all women by making them believe that they are all beautiful, which by the way doesn't cut against the narrative that beauty is important. It only cuts against the exclusionary characteristics of beauty, right? So I think that that's sort of the standard that we're willing to stand for. But obviously you can do the alternative too, which is to assume that beauty is not beautiful at all. So through the course of my speech, I'm going to examine a couple of things. I'm going to firstly examine whether beauty is going to go away. Secondly, I'm going to examine whether beauty is in fact value positive or value negative a little later. And thirdly, I'm going to talk to you about why it is in the interest of the feminist movement. It is their primary obligation to ensure that they spread this narrative over and above any other narratives, right? So just a couple of clarifications uh, firstly, with regard to whether beauty is going to go away or not, right? In principle, I'll address this first. When, when we discuss things like beauty broadly, we're talking about the ascription of value to something. That isn't specifically only in conjunction to how we view people, but in relation to literally how we view every other constituent element in our universe as well. How we treat objects, how we treat cars, how we treat everything else as well. So I'd argue that it's in fact innately a human thing to ascribe value to certain things. Why do I think it's actually a justified claim on our side? Because you can probably do so under two circumstances. You can either emotively ascribe value to something, or you can do so rationally. But regardless of whether you choose to do so emotively or you choose to do so, do so rationally, there are still certain consequences that you're weighing up and you decide to come to a conclusion that X is better than Y. So the, the, the process of comparison and coming to a conclusion about something being better than the other thing in principle always means that something is going to be seen as more desirable than the other thing. So in principle, logically, beauty isn't going to go away. So to cut against that and to present a countervailing norm that says beauty doesn't matter, cannot possibly be the, the most easy thing to do, right? By definition, it has to be the harder thing to do. But secondarily as well, consequentially, and I think this is our biggest claim, right? And I think this is why opening government is also being a little insensitive to the plight of women broadly as well. Because here's the thing, it's going to be really hard to convince like women that beauty doesn't matter when all of their lives they've grown up in a patriarchal structure because this is a post-fact debate. You're not starting this retrospectively when the feminist movement started discussions when the debate or rather the democratization of con conversations about beauty happened. If you're starting it now and so many women, especially in the global south, are constantly constrained by the specific facts that my first speaker talks to you about because here's the principle from my first speaker's speech which is extremely important, right? It may seem arbitrary that we decide to view certain body types as important and others as not important, but it definitely has been influenced by the patriarchal sort of tendency to make it exclusionary because men want to say, ah, I have the perfect white which has the perfect beauty type. So they define it in exclusionary terms. So it's been excluding people, which means that a lot of women, day-to-day -day decisions that they undergo, what fairness came to buy, who they marry, how they want to be themselves, it is sad that they have to come to these sort of circumstances, but the fact of the matter is that that is the reality for a vast majority of women who live in global south nations. If that's true, to tell them that all of their decisions are worthless, everything they've done until their life, up to this point where they use beauty as a trait or beauty as a judgment-making process to come to a conclusion is pointless, will A, at the best case for government, create cognitive dissonance, which makes them feel like, what have they been doing all their lives? But at the worst case, it trivializes their problems and makes them feel categorically useless, which is obviously why even if you don't buy the principle, consequentially, it's a bad thing to do for literally the most of the world that exists today. The second thing that I'm going to examine then is whether beauty is in fact value neutral in the first place. Why is it value neutral? In fact, if anything at all, it is patriarchy's profound influence in how we understand conversations about women and how we understand discussions about what's beautiful and what's not beautiful that they make us naively think that beauty is just this arbitrary thing. Some people are born with it, some people aren't, but only very few women are born with it and they didn't really work for it. Nothing ever came to be. It's not like they tried to do certain things. It's not like there was any effort involved at all. They just magically happened to be gifted to the right body type and therefore you must celebrate them. You know what that does? It undermines the achievements of a vast majority of fashion models, a vast majority of people, women who genuinely do think that beauty is important because this is A, a post-fact debate, which means all of those women who genuinely taken beauty into consideration do in fact exist. You cannot ignore that stakeholder completely and say, oh, we don't care about them. Obviously, it would have been morally preferable and principally beneficial if we started out as a society that did not care about like beauty at all, right? That's obviously the best case version. 
like opposition cannot defend the burden and say we want to live in a society where beauty does exist but the fact of the matter is both in principle and consequentially beauty does exist if it if that's true and you're disregarding an entire stakeholder from this analysis obviously that's a problem but secondarily as well why is it such that this one arbitrary trait that has the only added disadvantage of men trying to exploit and define in specific terms whether it's beauty should be one that's disadvantaged but not any other arbitrary characteristic like I'm proud to be a Tamilian, I'm proud to be an Indian, I'm proud to be a Singaporean. All of those other arbitrary characteristics, well, even if it is arbitrary and it's actually value neutral and it's not value positive and there's no hard work and women just happen to be beautiful by birth, why is that something you should not celebrate? So the last thing I'm going to do then in my speech, if I've proven these two claims is to explain why the participatory norm actually is more powerful. But before that, I'll take closing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's actually very good because I think that you can get behind how corporations assess this as well because in a vast majority of cases because of the economies of scale, corporations actually profit off of making this narrative even more effective because once you democratize the process of beauty, then you can sell exclusive, like for instance, the prevalence of plus size sort of clothing wear that's now like thankfully more accessible to women from all across the world as well. So I don't think that we're going to get a lot of pushback from corporations given that their incentives are clearly towards profit motives and not towards spreading like a patriarchal narrative. Of course, it's true that in some circumstances they do do so, but I think that more money grabs than they are women hating but it's a really hard tell I can't really tell if that's true or not I really hope that they are more money grabbing in this one specific context but the second thing that I want to say broadly about this specific clash about why it's important like easy to benefit from the participatory norm is we've already done so for so many other arbitrary traits that once seemed impossible discussions about race were never meaningfully had under egalitarian lenses but after the development of constitutional declarations after the development of things like international institutions that recognize rights like the Bretton Woods conference after the development of just a general consciousness towards an attitude of egalitarianism we have this profound sense of inequality that is imbibed in most people across the world. That isn't to say that we're going to be able to convince the radical right-wing men who are at the extreme end of patriarchy immediately. Like, honestly, on both sides of the house, that's a lost cause. We're not going to make the absurd claim that we're going to convince them overnight. But for most of like society, which genuinely does at the very least attempt to inculcate values of uh, equality, we try to instill this as the most effective mechanism to propagate and propel the values of equality by saying everyone has access to the participatory norm that beauty is important because everyone can be beautiful. That only cuts against the exclusionary nature of beauty and not against beauty itself. For all those reasons, very, very proud to oppose. <laughs> I think opening opposition digs their own grave in this debate. They suggest that corporations do not fight against a norm that suggests everyone is beautiful. But the question we ask at closing government is why exactly is that? It is because corporations love a narrative that suggests people can be beautiful, that people are more beautiful than others, and an emphasis on beauty that allows them to continue to sell enormous numbers of products to women that increase and intensify a focus on beauty that enhances the self-identity and, and encourages women to spend and focus their lives around a, a fixation on beauty. I'll do two things in this speech and both largely focus around points of expansion. The first is on how this narrative is captured and co-opted by corporations in a way that is debate winning, and secondly how there is an existing principal obligation on the feminist movement to do this, which cuts, cuts across any practical benefit. The first thing to note on this argument about corporations is to suggest that the fundamental and unchangeable element of a narrative that says all bodies are beautiful is that beauty is a desirable and important trait, and that is something that's unavoidable. And, and despite what opening opposition suggests which well, no, we're only fighting against the exclusionary trait. It's perhaps an argument that it works if you believe that the narr that narrative exists exactly as it's written on an information slide, but the way that narrative is then supported and changed as it is internalized and, con and transmuted into society is a focus that when someone says that they're not feeling beautiful today, and you tell them you absolutely are, or you get a compliment from someone else, people come to place value on whether or not other people see them as beautiful, which fundamentally entrenches the importance of beauty as it exists. And rather than a narrative that suggests that that beauty is unimportant, allows people to fight back against it. How then is that narrative of all people being beautiful piggybacked or co-opted by corporations? We know that they have enormous incentives to do so, like the makeup or clothes market or fashion market is a billion if not trillion dollar industry worldwide, and that they also have capacity to do it. Things like ad campaigns that sell narratives or products that suggest women can be more beautiful, or like specific kinds of underwear as Dove does, or specific kinds of hair care, or specific 
kind of makeup. And again, the claim from opening opposition is, well, maybe those are beneficial because maybe plus size women can feel more attractive. But you have to question the ways in which corporations then sell that narrative. It is by having one plus size woman in an ad campaign who is still incredibly photoshopped, who is still made up, who is then suggest, well, that woman is beautiful, when that still exists as the narrative and a standard of beauty that is unattainable by the majority of women who do not have access to those corporate resources, or suggest that in order to be as beautiful as that woman who is traditionally unattractive, you need the products that that corporation is selling to you, and that that narrative once sold by corporations then becomes mirrored and, co and co-opted and in intensified by others who talk about the ways in which they're feeling beautiful or the, or, or the ways in which they compare themselves to others, makes a focus on the ways in which corporations or people in general or, or men themselves have a focus on beauty and how it then happens. How does that narrative then manifest? We say there's a couple of narratives that come from the narrative that all women or all bodies are beautiful. The first is that beauty is hierarchical. So even if you exist at a baseline of beautiful and that all bodies are beautiful in a way, you obviously know that some people are still more beautiful than others. And that is a narrative that men themselves, even when they accept this, buy into. Like rank lists of which women or which of their friends they find hottest is a way in which they even accept that no, no one's ugly, means that there is a hierarchical standard about what, state and what traits and standards of beauty exist and what is more attractive to people. And that is also then by corporations that even if you feel bad, good in your skin, there are ways in which you are able to feel more beautiful by selling those products to them. Secondly, that people can be beautiful. So the narrative that all bodies have potential for beauty might not be exactly how the opening of how opposition have read this slide, but it is often how that is transmitted into society and how it is internalized and accepted by people. Saying that you're really pretty under all that hair, or if you dressed a bit differently, people would see your real beauty, is a way that you suggest that there is something that is inside, but only unlockable by a corporatization and the consumerist version of beauty that allows people to be beautiful when they otherwise would naturally not be. And perhaps they would suggest that, well, we'll try and have a version that pushes back against that. We would say that, um, you know, you don't need anything to be beautiful, but you have to compare the ways in which corporations then sell that narrative to people, and it's one that is easily accepted and seen by others. Like, knowing that your friend is really hot because she does great makeup is a way in which you yourself internalize and cannot fight back against that norm because it is so entrenched. But importantly, we are the side that gives women the permission to not care about their standards of beauty. That you do not need to spend hours getting ready to go out. You do not need to spend eight times as long as the average man getting dressed in the morning to go to work because those standards of beauty are not important and those standards of beauty do not define you. And the only way in which you're able to overcome that are by buying into this. And we think it does push, push back against that corporate pressure. We recognize that it's a difficult thing to do, but there are a series of reasons to believe it would be successful. The first is, it is an incredibly empowering and kind of punk stance to take. Like, And that is something that it's often really encouraging or useful to be able to tell yourself that people are telling me something else, but I know that my beauty is not my outside, my beauty is something that doesn't matter, I have all these other beneficial traits, it's something that's kind of countercultural in a way that is useful. Secondly, it's often a preferable narrative to buy in, like, I do not think that it is the revealed preference of many women and they did not grow up in a society that encouraged them to spend enormous amounts of money and enormous amounts of time looking beautiful every day, they would rather buy into this narrative, so even if there was some immediate cost at which it's difficult to do, the long-term normalization and rolling and snowball effect of this model would make it easier to do overall, and that this detaches the importance of beauty and the capacity for corporations to do it. What then are the harms of that? The first is that we overcome what is an enormous cost upon women as it exists, and that is often a financial cost, and particularly for the less developed women that opening opposition wants you to care about, you have to question what is the response when you have to spend an even larger portion of your out of your income in order to pay out buy outfits that allow you to get a job. In terms of the amount of effort and cost and, and standards in which you are doing it, or the capacity to be hot in, in the, like the workplace in order to get ahead. But secondly, I would note that no, it's not. I would note that you are often racist in the way that those happen. So, like a belief that you have in order to be beautiful should get double eyelid surgery. In order to overcome that on their side, you have to fight against racism. But our side allows you to subvert and sideline it just by saying it doesn't matter if you're beautiful or not. You do not need that surgery. Closing. Because it's incredible, because it's something that is never satisfied. Like the reason that you feel beautiful is because you have bought a product that just need, keep needing to do that, and that the buying of that product is harmful because it is something that is harder than your access to it. The final thing that means this overcomes opening opposition, on even if you believe everything they say, because even if people can feel beautiful through the hard work that they talk about, that is hard work that is sexist, that is hard work that is unfair, and that is hard work that is regrettable. On the why women, why feminist movement has a principal obligation to this. Three reasons. The first is the narrative of beauty as it exists is patriarchy and is patriarchal and 
and like, you know, on faith should be rejected in its absolute rather than form. Secondly, the methods in which you fight back against that narrative are also playing into patriarchy. They also often rely on a sexualization of women saying that, no, honey, your legs look great in that in a way of reaffirming women, or that the fetishization in order to encourage, for example, black women that they are still beautiful, or requires fixation on the element of bigotry, like saying that you are hot for a fat woman, are ways in which you buy into existing um, uh, sexism, and that finally it justifies sexism that men often feel that women are still airheaded or fixated on their looks, even if you believe that all women are beautiful because you suggest that beauty is important. This is absolutely a norm that we should not support. So proud to propose. <laughs> Losing government says that this is a preferable narrative to sell without ever analyzing why it's preferable, probably hen like hinging themselves upon openings analysis about why it's easier to convince women within this narrative. We are going to extend on opening opposition's claim that this is a post-factor debate and that some beauty standards already exist and why it's difficult for women to like not care about beauty at all because I think they've also been slightly uncharitable to government bench because if government bench is completely successful in like teaching women or like explaining to women that beauty just doesn't matter, then probably Probably the impact they get from the rest of the society and the treatment they get the, from the rest of the society based on beauty is something they won't really care about if they are completely successful in doing that. What will crucially prove to you in this debate is why women do care about beauty and there are many reasons why they'll continue to care about beauty regardless of the amount of things that they want to do and like why it's easier therefore to convince people with our narrative because I think openings analysis just stopped there that oh it's a post-factor society and society already has so many beauty standards because unfortunately we don't think the feminist movement is so powerful that on both sides we'll change the most conservative mindsets of people. We won't change like societal beauty norms of people in most in most in the vast majority of cases. What we do have power on as a feminist movement is the people who subscribe to our identity as feminists. We change their mindsets and the amount of meaning that they impart to their own lives, and that's something we'll crucially prove to you in extension. But firstly, like one extraneous rebuttal to closing government, right? They said now corporations will sell you beauty. We, th we heard no analysis on this as to why it's problematic. If there is if there is meaning that you impart to your own life based on your beauty, we think it's perfectly fair for corporations to even sell you that but secondly we think it also makes it easier for you to fill into the society norm and like not face all the terrible impacts by feeling more beautiful or by being by even being more beautiful through the creams that the corporations try to sell to you they've never proved why the amount of treatment that you like the bad treatment that you get from society based on beauty ever changes on their side of the house this debate crucially becomes about how women or like people who subscribe to the feminist movement feel about feel about themselves Therefore, we are going to we are going to first say that given that this is a post-factor debate, if Gov is able to explain why women, even in this post-factor setting where society tells you what beauty is, are able to rationalize that beauty is not important, we'll probably not feel that much harm. We'll tell you why that's not as convincing and why our narrative is. Firstly, like the, note that societal coercion will remain the same on the both sides because I think it's the most conservative elements in society that try to push the most irrational beauty standard onto you. Therefore, we don't think no, any side changes that. Here, opening opposition says that, oh, women already have a lot of value to beauty, where opening government says, yeah, we'll educate them. Why? Two reasons why you cannot educate them to like just disregard any importance that they give to beauty in their life. Firstly, there is a lot of engagement with looks on a day-to-day -day basis. The, like you continue to look at yourself in the mirror, you have eyes, you can look at it. And the crucial capacity of the human brain to attach importance to attach importance or meaning to everything that it looks at, or every amount of information that we get from that put, like from that visioning, from that vision or from that sense of like our surroundings, the ability to just impart meaning to it is significantly crucial in terms of the amount of like and just because we can look at ourselves and just because we can impart meaning to what we look at is something which makes it difficult to tell women that it just doesn't 
matter. But the second thing is, when you lose out in society in terms of the treatment you get because of your beauty, you like to like impart the blame to certain irrational factors like beauty. Things like if you even if you go for a job interview and you are rejected because of your beauty, you don't try to rationalize that you're probably not as intelligent or you're probably not as nice. You try to rationalize it by saying I've been discriminated against because of that because of because me, I'm not beautiful. Therefore, it's significantly difficult for their side to ever push this idea that beauty is not as important. Comparatively, we think we'll be able to push more impact in women's life and the meanings that they meaning that they have in their life by telling them that everyone is beautiful. Why is this the case? Firstly, because we told you engage with looks on a day-to-day -day basis means that there's the ability to find meaning in it. That is to say, even if I don't look good based on societal standards, I can probably still think within myself that I have a good jawline, I have a good beard, I have a good mustache. Even if that doesn't fit into societal standards and probably society treats you the same way anyway on both sides of the house, the fact that you just can impart meaning to it is significantly beneficial to the way you perceive yourself, to so the amount of confidence it imparts in you when you deal with other people in society. Just feeling more beautiful, knowing that society has not forgotten beauty standards, feeling more beautiful gives you much more confidence when you engage with society. Therefore, it's significantly problematic on government where they say, we'll just tell women that, like, uh, that uh, we'll just tell people who subscribe to the feminist movement that, oh, beauty doesn't matter, without ever changing the idea that society is still going to treat you with the idea of beauty. Women will feel less confident when it comes to that. On the comparative, when they're able to attach meaning to beauty and feel beautiful, the confidence at least increases and the amount, like the kind of treatment that they are able to get probably becomes better. Yes. Un unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't think both sides in this debate are ever going to decrease the like unfortunate burdens that women have to face in society. On your side, even if you te even if you are able to convince like some portion of the society that beauty doesn't matter, like the like the toxic narratives of patriarchy are not something you can overturn through this narrative, or at least your analysis wasn't enough to prove that. Similarly, on our side of the house, probably by pr proving that all bodies are beautiful, we also don't change the societal narrative that yeah, all, like uh, uh, like if a woman who's socially who's so societally conceived to be not beautiful by current standards suddenly becomes beautiful. That's not our case. Our case is what women themselves perceive to be because we already proved to you how much importance you attach to beauty. We think it's easier to impart meaning to that engagement you have on a day-to-day -day basis with beauty than just telling women to disregard that factor in its entirety. But secondly, they said you need to be classified by other factors like intelligence etc. Firstly, we think they are equally arbitrary. Right? There's no justification why you should be judged by that and not by beauty. We think there are also inequalities within these other factors. Like you, can prob you probably can be intelligent in art, but if in India tells you that in engineering is the most important field to be in, you probably won't find meaning through that anyway, right? So all those other arbitrary factors are also something they can't push for in this debate. But given that, given that we've proven to you why women impart so much importance to beauty in status quo, they have no principle justification to say why this particular narrative is preferable. We didn't, they never proved, like, they never proved that despite women caring so much about beauty, why we should tell them to not care about beauty in the first place. We have told you that on both sides of the house, probably we are not, not as successful in changing the most conservative mindset. What we are successful at and what our target group in this debate is, is women who subscribe, women or people in general who subscribe to the feminist movement. What this does crucially is changes the amount of meaning you derive from beauty, right? In their world, we are telling women just not to derive any any meaning from beauty. We have given you three reasons why they continue to do so based on why you like to rationalize on the basis of irrational factors, why you like why you like to rationalize losses in society on the basis of things you just that are just not in your control. You probably think by societal indoctrination that you prob you need to be more intelligent to get that job. But when you don't get the job, you like to rationalize it by saying I was not beautiful and I was discriminated against. That's a feeling that never goes that never goes away on your side of the house because of the constant interaction you have with beauty and looks on a day-to-day -day basis. Therefore, what we crucially do from closing opposition is tell you why this increases the amount of meaning you can have in your life. Because when you look at yourself in the mirror, you can still feel that you have a nice beard. Uh, you can still feel you have a nice jawline. You can still feel you have a nice figure, irregardless of it probably being conceived as fat by society, but you can find meaning in that beauty. This is an easier narrative to sell to people and it benefits the amount of meaning people have in their lives, equally proud to propose.
issue with the opposition bench is that they try to reform a system that was perniciously skewed against women of class, colour and plus size women, they, that a system that exploits women financially that feeds to corporate incentives, and that changing that system would be a fundamental waste of the feminist movement's time to the extent that we buy the analysis CO gives us, the corporations will just do it anyways. Reforming that system was something that was impossible or else just a waste of time. Instead, we rejected that system and its patriarchal, hegemonic uh, uh, like terms that it came from. I want to talk about four things in this speech. Firstly, whether beauty matters or not. Secondly, who's better able to change the minds of the populace on either side. Thirdly, who can change other factors of society most importantly. Finally, why we get out over our own opening and convincingly win this debate. Firstly, on whether beauty matters, I want to talk about four things here. The first thing that we hear provoking opposition is that, well, society thinks beauty matters and they treat you on that basis. Note four responses here. The first is that is an argument against battling on beauty's terms. That is to say, if beauty is something that matters so deeply, then you still get those extrinsic confirmations which exist in society, telling you that even if the feminist movement thinks you are beautiful, you value yourself as not being beautiful and not good enough. That is to say, if you don't get any sexual partners, if you don't get any likes on social media, regardless of that which the feminist movement is telling you, you will internalise yourself as not being good enough, and the way the way that that plays out is either you become untrusting of the movement that is meant to be representing you, or as we perniciously tell you at closing government, you buy into corporate interests and think, ah, oh, well maybe I have the potential to be beautiful, but what I need to do is get some form of a double eyelid surgery to unlock that beauty that I would otherwise have, that I need to buy these clothing that people of a similar shape to me are wearing in this form of catalogue, that was particularly pernicious and devastating for those women. No thank you. The second reason that society thinks beauty matters is because it is a remnant of the current messaging that we currently get. That is, at the point where the feminist movement is itself focused on beauty, then obviously beauty is something that is considered paramount. But when that attention starts to focus, it's likely other things get to the fore. The third thing to note is the focus on beauty was just a conceded effort to undermine women by the patriarchy who were able to dictate the terms of what like, was beautiful in the first place. But the fourth thing to note is just many circumstances in society where the beauty of people didn't actively matter. That is, people often prioritise the humour, the intelligence, the skills that individuals have. The second thing that we hear from opening opposition, that's similar material to what we hear later from closing opposition, is that well, beauty is just an arbitrary thing, and that if beauty is arbitrary, it is a waste of time to try to change what people think about it. Note that beauty is something that people naturally believe. This feeds into similarly what we hear from closing opposition, who have a rebuttal extension insofar as it rebuts itself, insofar as they say, well, beauty is something that is natural. You look in a mirror and subsequently you ascribe value to yourself, or you look at someone else and subsequently you just naturally ascribe value to people. If it was a natural emotion that you had, the amount of training or messaging that the feminist movement gave you about what you consider beautiful wasn't going to change your opinion about those things. It wasn't going to change how women looked at themselves in the mirror. The fourth thing on whether beauty actively matters was again to talk by closing opposition when they say, well, there's benefits to people feeling beautiful, but that obviously, again, derives from the fact that we place so much emphasis on beauty under the status quo. Obviously, when you think that you're beautiful at the point where the feminist movement says, well, you are going to be beautiful, then you think that that is a particularly important thing, but it's the way you go about achieving that beauty that you sometimes wake up and don't see in yourself, and that plays into corporate interests that are particularly pernicious. No, thank you. That is why beauty does not... Uh, that, that, that's why, even if beauty matters, it's a waste of time to try to change the opinions of people. The second thing to notice is who better can change the minds of the populace. Two things to say here, this is specifically weighing into the clash that we hear in the opening half of this debate. First thing is all of the mechanisms that we hear from opening opposition, such as the democratisation of the movement, can be also peculiarly adapted to our side. That is, obviously, our movement will also be democratised, whatever. But the second thing to notice, we think, and this is specifically weighing into what was discussed in the opening half and breaking that deadlock, is it is comparatively easier, no thank you, to convince people of our side. That is for a few reasons, structurally. That is, if you believe the analysis in this debate about how entrenched people's beliefs on beauty are, that means it's quite hard to change. But under the status quo, people already have a predisposition to somewhat value other characteristics extrinsic to beauty, such as the skills, the intelligence, and the humour people have. So when opening opposition say, well, you're never going to get far right men on your side, then, yeah, then they're going to, because you're not going to be able to change their opinion on telling someone what they think is ugly is beautiful. But you can probably convince those people that the intelligence of an individual, the humour that that individual possesses, is a more important characteristic and trait than the beauty that they possess. So you're likely to get those people on side that you could never get under the opposition side, Meaning that every minute that you talk about beauty on their side was a disproportionate amount of time that you could be spending on other issues than material for the feminist movement. And note that this plays into other harmful stereotypes that just mar the, the, the potency of feminism generally. That is to say it feeds into harmful patriarchal stereotypes that women are only concerned with feminine traits like beauty and whatever, whereas if we disregard beauty, it's harder to level that criticism against the movement broadly. That's why you don't change the minds of... That, that's why it's much easier to change the minds of the populace under our side proportionally. 
Third thing I want to discuss in this debate, no thank you, is who can change other factors of society. And this is where we really pull ahead in this debate because we have almost no engagement from other sides. We know that particularly, and then this particularly by heart, bypasses that which, which comes up in the opening half, we tell you firstly that corporations are particularly pernicious in how they approach this. This is that even when they show plus size model, they're an exception to the rule, but moreover, they're specifically wearing clothes that are designed to make them look beautiful, meaning that people don't just think, well, I am plus size too, consequently I am beautiful. They instead think I could be as beautiful if I go after things like if I if I buy the clothes and purchase those things that are advertised to me, and they think they can unlock that potential, which is particularly harmful. But secondly, it just means corporations can co-opt the messaging of the feminist movement, and they, and they think that if they dress this way, people will see that in a beauty the closing opposition seems to think is so important. The only response, literally, that we get to this is, well, what's wrong with that? What was wrong with it is people were never satisfied. The way the corporate interest rolled may have meant it was like disproportionately going to affect people of low socioeconomic status. But even if we believe they're weird and analysis that it's fine for the corporatization of these things and it's fine to do that to women, then obviously that burden should fall on those corporations instead. Opening. On your really exceptional point, we do feel like beauty is a feminine and exclusive in this sense. There's literally just a much larger market of people to cater to women to cater to. So why aren't top taking women trying to advertise the democratization of beauty? Sure. So if corporations can advertise about how beauty is inherent and how everyone is beautiful, fine. But that is something that corporations with their infinite wealth and infinite capital should do. The feminist movement only gets limited political capital. It can only advocate for a few causes at a time. But moreover, it's difficult for them to change the minds of things that by your own analysis are so entrenched in society. Meaning that when it can discuss things, it should, set, it should instead emphasise those matters that could better empower other women, that bypass a lot of patriarchal norms that exist in society. The second thing to not is we just eliminate and minimise the importance of value descriptions that are necessarily linked to beauty. That is, you don't care as much if you're having less sex or getting less likes on the outside because beauty is inherently less important. And you remove pernicious norms associated with beauty, such as the racism that comes in turn with it sometimes. Finally, I want to explain why we've come up over our own opening. That is because we break this believability deadlock and show that it doesn't matter if this movement is successful or not. It is the way that you believe this movement, it is the way that you believe beauty is important that is particularly dangerous. That is the corporatization. But that even if you believe the opposition's analysis, Analysis, or on our opening government's analysis, that the fixation on beauty was something that was itself dangerous, that you were never satisfied with this. That was why it was so important to get rid of this norm entirely, not try to reform a broken system. Thank you. CG, OG, O, and then our extension, why we take this today. Look at CG. Three responses to that extension, to the only extension of why corporate interest will actually reinforce those beauty standards and why is that. Look, we think beauty, so we think from side opening up, like closing opposition. Uh, yeah. We think this debate is about on which side we see women like more being, like on which side we see women more capable of being convinced and being more happy about how they look. This debate doesn't change people's interactions towards them. Like racist people are going to be racist, uh, people who are bigoted are going to be bigoted. This debate is about how women derive fulfillment on which, if, on what narratives gives more fulfillment to women. Whether you're selling the narrative that how like beauty doesn't matter, or selling the narrative that all bodies are beautiful. We, have, we proved to you in our extension that this narrative, the latter proof, latter gives more fulfillment to women. But let's deal with closing government, right? No. They tell us that this this is actually in, in the like, like this actually increase, increases the way in which corporate cop, like corporates are able to exploit this. We think it's not exploitation when you find meaning from it. We think 
beauty in and of itself is a human instinct in the first place. Every person wants to look as beautiful as possible. We think in the society currently, people who don't conform to social standards of beauty do favor towards these things because they derive fulfillment from them. Even if I want to look fair, I, I can go through some surgery, etc. We think it's, it, it, that gives fulfillment to people in the status quo. Giving them avenue to actually do that is something they had to pro find problem within that. We are not able to understand what problems were there, right? They can't just simply say for, because it is ugly, because it increases the way in which corporates can actually target women. This is problematic. We don't understand. But secondly, they say that this gives permission to people. To, this gives. Uh, they tell the women because of this that you don't have to care about the beauty. But this is they can't just simply say what is the universal fact, right? They can't just simply deny that. Women do care about the beauty in the first place. You can't change the perception that beauty doesn't. Like also, secondly, they also had to prove that how are they going to make sure that we women get convinced by the idea that beauty does not matter in the first place. None of the government have done that. But since they haven't done that, we think on our side as well, they have given you sufficient reasons why beauty in and of itself is a human instinct and why women do want to look beautiful in the first place. And that is, this is and in, in, even if they don't conform to social standards, we from closing opposition for extension have given you reasons why they can find ways in which they can look more beautiful, right? Through like having a different jawline, having a different physique, etc. This what this is what gives them fulfillment in the first place, right? But we think that our narrative tells that all bodies are beautiful, right? Which means that some women who are able to find beauty within themselves don't need that fairness cream in the first place, don't need those cosmetic surgery in the first place, right? It, it is the way in which you make sure that it is the way in which you are able to convince women on how to feel better about themselves, right? Let's deal with opening government, right? Before I'm done, I'll take a, I'll take the pure at the end of the question. But look, they take a heavy burden on themselves when they say that now people who take job interviews would buy into this narrative that people, beauty does not matter. First, we don't think that's true. We think people wouldn't buy these both narratives in the first place, right? People who are racist are going to be actually uh, like discriminated towards women who don't conform to social standards in the first place, right? Secondly, we think that if those people, so this debate is about specifically people who are a part of feminist movement. If they are not a part of feminist movement, they do consider beauty in the first place. They do are discriminatory. Uh, they are discriminatory in the first place. So we don't think how are they able to convince those people that actually beauty does not matter, right? So before coming into the impacts of beauty does not matter, you also need to prove that how are you going to make sure that people come into the feminist movement through selling this idea. You didn't do that. Sorry, you are out, right? What is our extension, right? We think that some beauty standards do matter to women, right? We think that societal coercion exists on both sides, right? We think societal coercion exists on their side. On which side of the are women able to able to feel much better about themselves, right? We think on our side those are able to impact meaning to women. You are able to tell to the women you can find other ways in which you can look more beautiful, right? You can be for proud of yourself and feel feel fulfilled about how like for example or what kind of hair you have or like what kind of physique you have or like that also counts in the beauty which means even if you don't conform to the majority standard you are still able to find good women if you tell all bodies are beautiful in and of itself it just lies in the, in the eyes of the beholder right which means on our side of the house you are to even if society discriminates against you tells you that you don't conform to social societal standards you find ways in which you can look beautiful and be proud in, in, in of itself but on their side of the house firstly they haven't been able to convince women that you are able to make sure that women don't care about these things, but that means that they are going to face discrimination on their, women are going to face discrimination on their side of the house, right? Which means you have to prove in this debate that how are you able, able to make sure that women are going to buy into this idea, right? But second, you also need to prove, even if you are able to convince women, how women are able to become much better on your side of the house, right? Since you don't do that, we think because societal coercion is going to exist, with that societal coercion, how women are going, if, when you tell, and even if you convince the women that beauty does not matter, how women are going to feel better, like, because this is like, this is an idea which needs convincing, you haven't done that, you are, uh, the, like, the bench is out of the debate, right, before I move on, go. <laughs> I didn't understand that too. I'm really sorry. Like, if you can, I, 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 I'm really sorry, but I didn't understand. All right. Why do we differ from opening opposition? Firstly, we think there was an inherent problem with the opening opposition case in the first place, right? Because at one, on, in one speech they say that we are going to change man's philosophy on, on what looks more beautiful, more beautiful. Secondly, they go back on their stance and say that look, we can't do that. It's obviously, uh, uh, we, 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 and they simply change the case, right? Which makes the look, case look much weaker. But secondly, let's look at way in which how we like differ from opening opposition, right? Opening opposition say that uh, you are denying women the right to feel more beautiful. You disregard that right, and that's why it's wrong for you to do so, right? We think we move, we, 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 we went further than that, right? We, we have told you that how it's a, how beauty is an inner fixture is an instinct that women want to be access, access, like want to have access to. 
the, the, and even if they are not able to uh, get access to that, women are able to find ways in which they can look more prettier. Women are able to find ways in which if they don't have a face that actually conforms to social standards, they're able to find meaning in that as well, right? They're able to find ways in which they can go to some shops even if that doesn't, uh, if they can go to some places and like, uh, like get some hair or find ways in which they can feel that they are looking more beautiful, right? Because if you are able to sell this narrative on our side of the house, which, which, which where women, uh, uh, if you are able to sell, sell this narrative and convince women, women are able to find meaning in, their, in the way in which they look, right? We think on our side of the house, we have given you reasons to believe that societal culture, on the way in which women have to deal with society, societal pressure, in which you are able to tell women that look, all bodies are beautiful, so even if some person does it, does tell you that you don't look beautiful in the first place, uh, you don't conform to the social, social standard of beauty, women are going to go ahead and find ways in which they are able to, uh, to like make themselves look, uh, what make, what makes themselves, them look more appealing in the first place, right? That is why women do care about beauty in the first place and we have proved to you why women are able to find ways in which they, they can look much better or like make themselves much better about them, themselves. Though that, that side denies them the right to do so, incredibly proud. So, uh,